Good afternoon, everyone. And the first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions. And in order to get as many people in as possible, we'll be grateful for short, succinct answers wherever possible and questions. Uh, question one, Neil Bibby. To ask the Scottish Government what account the business case for the Edinburgh-Glasgow Improvement Programme takes of the impact that construction work could have on passenger numbers. Minister Keith Brown. Uh, the Egypt final business case includes provision for compensation paid under the rail regulatory regime for planned disrupted, disrupted access uh, to the rail network. Neil Bibby. I thank the uh, Minister for that answer. The Minister has confirmed in written answers earlier this year that 28 trains stop or pass through Dalmeny every day at peak times. Under the plans outlined in the business case, an additional 28 trains will be diverted at peak times while the Winsborough Tunnel was closed. How does the Minister expect this to be managed and still meet his commitment in a previous written answer that all connections will be maintained during the tunnel closure? Minister. Uh, can I thank the member for the question? I have provided information in the past as to how it is intended by uh, Network Rail and others to manage this disruption. The disruption is inevitable, of course, if you are going to have a capital improvement project of this type. But there will be use, the use of buses, which I have mentioned previously. There is still work ongoing to try and minimise the time for that uh, disruption taking place. So a great deal of work is going on by all the partners involved to minimise the disruption. But it is inevitable that we are going to have disruption if we are going to have these substantial uh, improvements, many of which, in my view, should have been made uh, decades ago. Thank you. Neil Finlay. According to the Government, the failure to construct the Ammon curve on this line will mean that the Winchborough Tunnel will close for a minimum of 44 days at a cost of £10 million to be paid in compensation to ScotRail. This will mean 44 days of expensive travel disruption across central Scotland. Will the Minister look again at this crazy decision with a view to build, building the Ammon Cord, thus investing in much-needed infrastructure and avoiding the waste of scarce public funds? Minister. I am sure all those experts which have been involved in this, uh, for example, Network Rail, the engineers, Transport Scotland, will take note of the reference to this being a crazy decision. Uh, but, of course, the alternative proposed by Neil Finlay was to spend upwards of £60 million uh, on a cord which would be superseded by the Egypt project, so much of an abortive expenditure. We are not in the game of wasting that level uh, of public resource. Perhaps this party was previously, but we are not. And what I have said previously, the 44 days to which he refers, I would say, is a ceiling rather than the minimum disruption. We're working very hard to make sure we can bring it down from that. And we'll put in place the appropriate measures to make sure we minimise disruption by providing alternative forms of transport as well. Hey, thanks. Question two, Sarah Boyack. To ask the Scottish Government for what reason there was a delay in the publication of the business case for the Edinburgh-Glasgow Improvement Programme. Minister Keith Brown. The Egypt final business case was completed in October 2013, consistent with the recommendation by Audit Scotland that Transport Scotland should review and update the business case process by December 2013 and was published at the earliest opportunity. This followed a review of the commercially sensitive elements of the business case to produce the version approved by Scottish Ministers for publication on the 27th of January 2014. Thank you. Sarah Bayer. Does the Minister not accept the huge disappointment about this business case because uh, we've got project costs up, we've got the ambition down, this project is not doing what initially was going to deliver and the time frame has now been abandoned. And this is a once lauded flagship transport policy which is now completely unrecognisable. Does the Minister not realise that the final business case poses even more questions about the long-term vision, sustainability and his own handling of this key project for Scotland? Minister. Uh, no, I don't accept that. I think if you look at the history of this case, there was a consultation process uh, which went uh, ahead uh, after 2011, a very extensive consultation process. Of course, there is a situation of us having had around about 26 per cent drop in our capital budget, 11 per cent drop in our revenue budget. And we have to look at these projects in the context of the available resources. That's what we do. We manage these very carefully, unlike some previous transport schemes I could mention. That having been done with the support of Atkins, we came up with the uh, new version of the scheme, which was going to contain at least 80 percent, perhaps more, of the original scheme, but at a reduced cost of £650 million. We were urged by that side to spend more money, for what purpose it wasn't always clear, but to spend more money to get back up to the £1 billion. We have announced, first of all, that the cost of the electrification, the core part of the scheme, has been reduced by £50 million. 
and that's allowed us to put more money into an iconic uh, development of Queen Street Station in Glasgow because of some opportunities which have arisen. We've also put more money into the optimism bias or the contingency. So I'm convinced this is a very good scheme. I, unlike Sarah Boyack, I'm convinced it's supported by uh, many people across uh, Scotland, uh, especially in Edinburgh to Glasgow, but more importantly for those other parts of the rail network which will benefit from a more efficient uh, service. A 42-minute journey time, electrification of the route through Falkirk High, the Edinburgh Gateway Station providing links to the airport, and of course the fantastic development of Haymarket Station, which members may have seen. Uh, so this is going ahead. Much of it's been completed. More will be done. The Commonwealth Games will be uh, the long stop for making sure the Cumber and All section of that is done. And so I'm very pleased with the progress that's been made and with the project which is still to come. Dear, dear. Thanks. Um, Bruce Crawford, briefly, please. Uh, Minister, thank you for the answer. I just wonder if you'd share with me that it's all this doomsday scenarios that keep getting painted by Labour about this project, because I see what's happening in the ground in my constituency. And will the Minister agree with me that it's great that in places like Stirling, where there's already work going on to strengthen bridges, create new crossings into the Riverside area, where there are many people employed, spending lots of money in the local economy, that actually this is having a beneficial effect now, right throughout Scotland and in the areas that are affected. Minister. I think Mr Crawford is absolutely right. I mean, to spend uh, the money we've already spent, but to spend up to £742 million pounds on capital works, which brings employment and improvements to the productivity of the country by improving our transport network, is, I think, a very good thing. I would have thought it would have been uh, welcomed by members across the chamber. It's important to note, though, that much of this has been done because it wasn't done previously. Now, I've said a number of times in this chamber there has been decades of underinvestment in the transport network in Scotland, and I've had some sceptical looks for saying that. But yesterday, we had the Transport Minister Minister Patrick McLaughlin coming to Scotland to say exactly the same thing. Even though he was a transport minister back in 1989-1992, we are happy we are cracking on with projects that should have been done many years ago. Thanks. Uh, question three by Claire Baker has not been lodged, but a satisfactory explanation has been provided. Question four, Lewis MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government what the estimated cost is of upgrading the East Coast Railway line between Aberdeen and the Central Belt at Montrose. Minister Keith Brown. This would very much depend on the nature of the upgrade which is proposed. Uh, Network Rail considered three options as part of its route utilisation strategy, uh, Generation 2, published in June 2011, to remove the single line constraint at Montrose, which affects journey times on the Aberdeen to Central Belt route, and the high level cost estimates uh, to undertake this infrastructure work are between £50 and £200 million at 2010 prices. Ms MacDonald. I'm grateful to the Minister for his reply. Given the cost that he's just mentioned, and given the uh, challenge of reducing journey times between Aberdeen and Glasgow and Edinburgh, which is indicated as something that the next Scottish Railway franchise would support, clearly there, the, there are two ways to address that. One is to improve the infrastructure, the other is simply to have trains stop at fewer stations. Which route is he intending uh, to go down, and is the Scottish Government uh, uh, committed uh, to making progress with the infrastructure challenges that are responsible for so many of the long journey times uh, on those routes. Minister. Yeah, I think the member quite rightly raises the tension between more stations, more access for people and journey times, and both are very important. We try to find the right balance, and we've seen new stations open on that route. But I think rather than say the route that I would continue to go down or the route that I would choose, it's best to wait until we have the feasibility study, which is ongoing just now, to see how we can best achieve that reconciliation between journey times, which are very important, uh, and making sure we have as much access. And if I can point out, of course, uh, Lawrence Kirk Station is one example where we've seen a huge interest, a huge uptake, uh, and increased patronage numbers across the network. I think those are two live issues, but I think uh, the member raises a, an interesting point, and I'm very keen. I asked before he'd asked me, officials of this some months ago, about what would be possible on this route, and I undertake to keep him updated on that. Thank you very much. Question five, Annabel Goldie. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of the recently announced £90 million in additional costs, whether it plans further upgrades to the Glasgow Edinburgh Rail Link under the current improvement plan. Minister. Uh, cost increases within the final business case incorporate uh, more ambitious plans around the redevelopment of Queen Street than originally planned. Uh, whilst no further upgrades are planned during the first phase uh, from that which I announced in July 2012, remaining elements of the Edinburgh Glasgow Improvement Programme will be delivered in future phases. Annabel Goldie. Deputy Presiding Officer, the SNP 2011 manifesto beguiled us with journey times of just over 30 minutes between Glasgow and Edinburgh. Now we're told, forget that, we might get journey times of 42 minutes in five years' time. 
Bigger trains and longer platforms may address a capacity issue, but what I and the many other regular commuters on this route want now are quicker trains and shorter journeys. When is the Minister going to even partly deliver on his manifesto promise? Minister. Hey, I've laid out exactly when we'll do that with the publication of the final business case, but I've made the point in my original answer, I would make it again, that this is the first phase of Egypt. There's more to come after this. We've also said that after we've electrified the uh, Edinburgh to Glasgow line, we will start to uh, electrify around 100 kilometres of the remaining uh, track in Scotland every year. So that's a, a substantial commitment. And although it is important to emphasise the extent to which Glasgow and Edinburgh will benefit from this, they already have four lines there. We also have the perspective, perspective possibility of uh, high speed rail between Edinburgh and Glasgow. It's very important as well to concentrate on the benefits for other parts of the network as well. So we will continue to do that. Further phases of Egypt will come forward. But given the constraints that we have on the budget, I think this is an excellent project. It looks at those resources. It makes sure that we spend them properly. And I think if you look at our track record on Airdrie to Bathgate uh, and on previous uh, major initiatives such as the M74 and so on, we've got a track record of delivering these projects. But we do so in the context of the resources which we have. Thank you. Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. When will the passengers in Central Scotland benefit from those journey time reductions and service improvements? Um, the Minister has repeatedly stated that, that Phase 2 will go ahead, but in his own business case um, states that Ministers will not take a decision until a later date. Minister. Well, of course, the initial benefit will to be reduced to 42 minutes. It wasn't quite just over 30 minutes, as was described by Annabel Goldie in the original case. It was 37 minutes. But originally, uh, what we're saying now is we, we managed to do this 42 minutes, major reduction, about a 20% reduction in the time travel between Edinburgh and Glasgow in the first phase. Further phases will come after that. And, of course, that's a decision to be taken uh, as uh, time and resources allow. But that's to me, a substantial improvement, both in terms of capacity, the efficiency of the railway, the, the environmental impact of the railway being elect electric rather than being uh, diesel. So there's huge benefits that will happen in the early stage. And I think many people travelling regularly between Glasgow and Edinburgh will be grateful for that initial uh, journey time reduction for them. And, of course, the additional capacity we'll have on that line. In six, Willie Coffey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it is working with service providers and local authorities to improve mobile phone coverage across the country. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary Nicola Sturgeon. Uh, the Government is committed to achieving improved mobile coverage across Scotland. The development of future-proofed mobile and fixed networks will be essential to realise the ambition we have for world-class connectivity by 2020. We've got a regular programme of engagement with all UK mobile network operators and we're working to remove barriers to investment in mobile. We're also collaborating with industry and local authorities to test new delivery models that can help to extend coverage. And this includes developing a pilot to provide mobile services for the very first time on the Isle of Col. Uh, we're also working closely with local authorities likely to benefit from the UK Government's mobile infrastructure project to ensure that the initiative has maximum impact for Scotland. Many thanks. Willie Coffey. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? She's aware that mobile phone coverage in many communities in Scotland is still very poor, despite the coverage obligations placed on the mobile network operators. With 4G services beginning to roll out, can the Cabinet Secretary give me any assurance that those communities who currently get, can't get 3G services will be covered by 4G services? Otherwise, of course, those communities face continued exclusion from access to digital services. Secretary. As I said in my original answer, we are committed to uh, doing everything within our powers to improve connectivity. I absolutely agree with Willie Coffey that coverage needs to improve. Um, it would be premature at this stage for the government to uh, take direct action in the way we're doing, for example, with the Step Change programme, given that the extent of commercial 4G rollout and the UK government's mobile infrastructure project isn't uh, yet known, but at this stage, we are very much focused on removing barriers to investment which are in our power to address. For example, uh, one of the issues that is often raised is Scottish planning system, which for telecoms is often cited as being less permissive than planning regimes elsewhere in the UK. And the local government minister has already committed to reviewing the planning system. So I can give Willie Coffey an assurance that we remain very focused, although our powers are limited in terms of mobile connectivity, uh, on ensuring that connectivity is improved and that we see uh, maximum rollout of 4G across the country. Many thanks. Question 7, Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what consultation Transport Scotland has with communities when considering trunk road closures at night. Minister Keith Brown. 
Uh, for planned maintenance schemes, our operating companies carry out prior consultation with the emergency services, elected members, community councils, local roads authorities, uh, authorities haulage and freight companies, and other affected stakeholders. Planned closures are also advertised in the local press, and letters are issued to residents and businesses in the area. Bruce Crawford. I thank the Minister for his response. Will the Minister agree with me that consultation, in particular with the communities in the Strathfilling area, when planned closures of the A82 are taking place, needs improvement? Is he aware, for instance, that on Tuesday 21st, 22nd, 23rd January, the A82 was closed at Pulpit Rock without any apparent consultation or notice being undertaken with Strathfilling community? Does he recognise that for people in places like Tyndrum, Cray and Larrick and Cullin, that closure of the A82 can cause major disruption as they attempt to access services in Helensborough, Dumbarton or Glasgow. And can the Minister therefore ensure that through Transport Scotland that this situation is reviewed and consultation improvements delivered? Minister. Uh, given what the Member says, I am happy of course to go back to Transport Scotland and ask them to examine the processes by which they consult uh, with local communities. I have mentioned in my original answer a fairly long list of people they consult for plan closures. Of course, the 82 and the works at Pulpit Rock are extremely difficult. Uh, they are actually building out in, over the water uh, and against a backdrop of a very steep slope on one side, which has included things like uh, trees falling and a very large rock falling as well. So they are dealing in very difficult circumstances. But I do agree with the Member it is very important that the local communities are kept as fully aware as possible and get maximum notice for the reasons that he's mentioned and, as I say, undertake to speak to Transport Scotland in that context. Thanks. Question 8, Margaret McCullough. Hmm. To ask the Scottish Government when it will provide an update on the purchase of Glasgow Presswick Airport. Cabinet Secretary Nicola Sturgeon. Uh, I wrote to the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee yesterday outlining the actions the Government has taken since acquiring Glasgow Presswick Airport. A copy of this letter has also been sent to all MSPs for their information and awareness. Thank you. Margaret McCullough. Since the purchase of the airport, no business case or further information about the Government's plans for the airport has really been forthcoming. What steps will the Minister take which can be reported to Parliament today to return Presswick to profitability without skewing the market away from Glasgow Airport? And does the Minister agree that the future of both Glasgow Airport and Glasgow Presswick is of the utmost importance to the Scottish economy? On the latter part of Margaret McCulloch's question, then, yes, I absolutely agree about the importance of Presswick Airport. That's why the government stepped in uh, to acquire the airport, to save the airport from closure and, of course, to safeguard the jobs that are directly and indirectly dependent on uh, Presswick Airport. In terms of the first part of Margaret McCulloch's question, as I indicated, I, I set out uh, yesterday in a letter to the Infrastructure Committee uh, the steps that have been taken to acquire the airport, uh, the arrangements that have been put in place to ensure corporate governance, uh, the steps that have been required to take to ensure business continuity of the airport. Uh, I set out some of the arrangements in terms of ensuring that the airport has the working capital to meet its financial obligations. I set out uh, detail on stakeholder engagement and, crucially, uh, set out that we have taken steps to appoint a senior adviser uh, who, over a period of three months, uh, will uh, take forward the initial business case that was put in place for the acquisition of the airport to make sure that we have very clear plans to turn the airport around. And uh, I very much hope and believe that it can be returned to profitability. So that information has been set out. I appear uh, before the Infrastructure Committee on, I believe, the 19th of March. And, uh, at an appropriate point, which I believe will be when we have the output of the work of the adviser, I will, as I always said, I would come back to Parliament to do a full oral statement to Parliament at that time. Briefly, James Kelly. The Deputy First Minister first announced to Parliament in October the intention to take, uh, to take Presswick into public ownership. Why is it taking four months for us to get any update to Parliament? Has the Deputy First Minister been too busy running the referendum campaign instead of looking after Scotland's priorities? Cabinet Secretary. I, I'm, I'm happy to have banter across the Chamber, as members are aware, at any time. But this is a move the Government made. We made it reluctantly uh, because we would have preferred another option for Presswick Airport. But we uh, made this move in order to secure the future of Presswick Airport and safeguard the jobs that depend on it. Now, I would have hoped that James Kelly uh, could have put to one side the temptation to score political points here and instead get behind the Government. Now, he talks about timescales. When I announced to Parliament the intention 
to purchase Presswick Airport. We then went into a process of due diligence uh, to acquire the airport. Since then, we have had to take a number of steps to ensure that the airport can continue to operate, things like transferring of licences. Uh, we've had to make sure the corporate governance arrangements are in place, and we'd be going through a process to appoint an advisor that can now give us the best advice on how to take the airport forward. Uh, I uh, encapsulated all of that information in the letter to the committee ahead of my appearance to the committee. I would have thought that all members of this chamber would be behind the efforts of the government to turn around Presswick Airport so that we can ensure it has a positive long-term future. That's what I'm focused on and I would hope that James Kelly and future exchanges in Presswick Airport would just put the party politics to one side. We can engage on that on other issues and get behind us on this. Many thanks. And we now move to culture and external affairs. Questions? Question one, Jamie Hepburn. I don't know if I should wait, President Officer, until the minutes. Okay. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what benefits Creative Scotland's youth music initiative could bring to groups in Common Ald and Colsaith. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop, when you are ready, um, which will I'm sure be as soon as possible. Yeah, thank you. Uh, go for it. Uh, President Officer, the Youth Music Initiative plays a vital role in creating career opportunities for Scotland's talent of the future, as well as a chance for Scotland's young people, some of whom would not otherwise have had the opportunity to participate in music making. And already, we're already delivering a number of projects in North Lanarkshire, offering new ways for young people to engage in music. Uh, these uh, projects include the Kodai Choral Instructions for all primary five pupils, and an additional ten specifically tailored projects that allow young people to develop music skills and experiences. Jamie Hebron. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. My constituents are fortunate to have uh, much musical talent amongst its young people, epitomised uh, by initiatives such as the fantastic Whiteley's Primary uh, School of Rock. Uh, I wonder, though, if the Cabinet Secretary could uh, set out how uh, those areas and those groups who may qualify for funding uh, but aren't aware of it can be identified, what steps can be uh, taken to raise awareness of such opportunities? Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. Uh, I've also heard uh, talented young musicians uh, from North Lanarkshire. In terms of the Youth Music Initiative, Creative Scotland are about to begin a review of the operation of that successful in initiative. The terms of reference uh, could include the identification of gaps in provision and knowledge of this scheme, and that would allow us to build on the strengths of the programme but also consider changes to perhaps reach groups that otherwise haven't been able to, to uh, make the best use of the YMI, YMI initiative to date. Many thanks. Question two, Michael McMahon. The Scottish Government, what advice has received regarding an independent Scotland share of the UK's overseas properties? The Secretary Fiona Hislop. <coughs> The Scottish Government has considered information from a range of sources. As Scotland's future makes clear, an independent Scotland will establish an overseas network of 70 to 90 international offices, building on Scotland's existing capacity and our share of the UK's international assets. Michael McMahon. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response? In re recent weeks and in a variety of settings, including evidence sessions at Westminster, a series of experts have cited international law and legal opinion to highlight their concerns over the, pr the practicalities of sharing diplomatic assets currently held by the UK. Does the Cabinet Secretary have any legal advice that contradicts those opinions, and if so, will she publish it so that the ongoing debate can be fully informed? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the, uh, the member might not be aware, but the Permanent Secretary to the FCO, Simon Fraser himself, on the 6th of November, told the Foreign Affairs Committee that the UK is already co-located in Canada, uh, already uh, in uh, co-location with Germany and France in different areas, and also with New Zealand and Estonia. So I think the practical experience perhaps outweighs that. But in terms of international law, it's, uh, it's neither clear or settled on the issue. And indeed, as the uh, Professor James Cross Crawford and Alan Boyle, who were the, the uh, commissioned and paid for UK government advisers in this area, said in practice, uh, Scotland's status in international law and that of the remainder of the UK would depend on what arrangements the two governments made between themselves before and after the referendum and on whether other states accepted their positions on such matters as continuity and succession. But, presiding officer, I think in my examples of the other co-locations that already exist and are expanding uh, from the UK and other countries, I think that gives you a practical sense of what is possible, what is practical and what is already happening. Many thanks. Question three, Ian Gray. To ask the Scottish Government what estimate it has made of how much it would cost an independent Scotland to establish overseas representation. Secretary Fiona Hislop. 
future makes clear, an independent Scotland will establish an overseas network of 70 to 90 international offices, building on Scotland's existing capacity and our share of the UK's international assets. According to figures published in January 2012, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office estate was valued at an estimated £1.87 billion. This included owned office buildings, residences, staff, residential accommodation and other ancillary accommodation. Thank you. Ian Gray. Cabinet Secretary's answer made clear, once again, any estimate that she has, and she didn't appear to have one, assumes uh, an actual share of UK overseas assets and properties, not uh, collocation. And as she revealed in her answer uh, to Mr McMahon a moment ago, uh, whether that would be the case or not, she herself has admitted is neither clear nor settled. The White Paper says that the Scottish Government intends, and that's the word, that Scotland will have an overseas network in place from day one. Will the Cabinet Secretary acknowledge that that is highly unlikely if, in fact, there is a legal dispute over the ownership of overseas property? Uh, and will she tell us then, for those living and working overseas uh, who depend on consular assistance, what is her plan B? Secretary. Well, will the member not recognise by his own question that therefore the agreed cooperation with the UK government uh, would be a responsible thing to do? And in terms of our agreements with them, I think it's perfectly possible. Scotland's future document sets out that uh, the costs, the estimated costs and running costs of a network would be in the region of £90 million to £120 million for those offices. In terms of our population share, it's perfectly possible and perfectly doable. And in terms of what we can do, going forward between that period of September 14 and March 2016, does he not agree with me that the best thing that the UK government should do in the, in, in, in the occasion of a yes vote is to make sure that the Section 30 of the Edinburgh Agreement is carried out and to best effect we make sure that we act in the mutual interests, self-interests of both the people of Scotland and the rest of the UK and that most definitely would be ensuring that representation is there. We're already, we already have representation in a number of, of countries and in and it's clearly possible, as was set out in my previous question, for that, that, that agreement to take place in a rational and responsible way. And I think the people of Scotland would expect no less. Many thanks. Jamie McGregor. Uh, quite apart from the embassies and consulates, does the Minister recognise the work done in 110 international offices of the British Council in promoting Scotland's interests overseas? It can't be guaranteed that this work would continue on an independent Scotland, so isn't that another good reason for staying in the UK? You'll be aware the British Council works with a, a number of, of organisations. We have a very productive relationship with the British Council. Again, in terms of our reference to, to is, is, as the British Council is established by trust, it's part again of the responsibility and assets that we would have and would continue to share. And indeed, we set that out. And I'm delighted I was with the British Council only recently when we were celebrating Celtic connections with the Rajasthanis that came over, the musicians that came to Scotland. I think it's small-minded to think that the British Council was suddenly do not want to work would not want to work with Scotland and would continue to work with Scotland in an independent Scotland. That's something that was set out again in Scotland's future. George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary inform the Chamber as to the overseas representation of other small European nations, such as Ireland, who have recently confirmed their intention to open an embassy in Zagreb following Croatia becoming the twenty eighth member state of the European Union? Yeah, I think the example of Ireland is one to be commended. Uh, they're expanding their FCO provision as it is just now. If you look at countries like Denmark and indeed Ireland, Finland, Slovakia and New Zealand, uh, they usually have between 50 and 100 overseas missions and usually between 1,100 to 2,700 uh, 2, staff. Uh, that is the, the proposals that they have. That is the representation that they have. And there's no reason why an independent Scotland not, cannot carry out its responsibilities successfully as these other small, independent nation-states do. Many thanks. Question four, Graham Day. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it encourages local and national organisations to work in partnership to promote historic locations and events. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. The Scottish Government encourages partnership working in many different areas uh, with a wide range of organisations to promote our historic locations and events. Nationally, Historic Scotland regularly works with public agencies, Visit Scotland and Events Scotland and national charities like the National Trust for Scotland. They also work with local groups such as the Heritage Staying Group in Linlithgow, the Abroth Abbey Action Group in the Members' Own Constituency and the Weems Caves Working Group in Fife. In addition, the 
uh, first ever historic environment strategy will set out uh, collaborative ways of uh, promoting partnership working going forward. Thank you. Graham Day. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and draw members' attention to my register of interest? I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary is aware of the formation of the 2020 group in Arbroath involving Historic Scotland, Visit Scotland, Angus Council and the Arbroath Abbey Action Group, which is working to create a suitable build-up to and celebration of the 700th anniversary of the Declaration of Arbroath. And can I ask her whether she believes this is a sort of engagement and cooperation between public bodies and ordinary members of the public with an interest in a subject which can best realise the potential of some of our historic locations and events of global significance. Yeah, I was very pleased to visit our growth in the, at the invitation of the member in the summer and had the opportunity to engage with the local action group. I heard about their initial plans, but I'm very pleased to hear how much that has progressed over recent months. And a lot of that has to do with the, the cooperation between the volunteers in the local community and national agencies such as Historic Scotland. Uh, and I think that early preparation for that 700th, uh, 700th anniversary, bringing everyone together, uh, bodes well for the future. Many thanks. Question five, Mark Biaggi. To ask the Scottish Government how an independent Scotland would increase inward investment in the film and television sectors. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. Uh, the Scottish Government and its partner agencies uh, are, is already actively promoting inward investment in the screen sector. In particular, the Creative Scotland Location Service has helped films such as The Railway Man, Sunshine and Leith and Skyfall to shoot on location in Scotland. The Outlander television series currently filming in Cumbernauld will be Scotland's biggest ever inward investment in screen production. In 2012-13, the Scottish public sector invested some £21 million in film and television, including almost £12 million in, uh, from the Scottish Government to MG Alba and almost £8 million from Creative Scotland to the sector generally. With independence, however, we could still do more, and Chapter 9 of Scotland's Future uh, sets out the intention to maintain and existing fiscal incentives for screen production and to look at ways to encourage further development in the sector. Mark Biagi. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. And Edinburgh has certainly had noticeable successes recently as a film location, but generally speaking, Scotland can still look enviously on our neighbours' uh, film and TV industries. What steps would the Cabinet Secretary envisage taking in particular on infrastructure, which seems to be the key factor in attracting uh, inward investment and has been expressed as such by many experts in the field? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Scottish Government is currently considering the submission and report commissioned by Scottish Enterprise and the Film Delivery Group into infrastructure, particularly film studios. It's an issue that's been raised repeatedly in the Chamber. Um, but also we need to look at other aspects. For example, um, if you look to Ireland, um, it gives both generous tax reliefs, um, more uh, generous than are available in the UK, but also devotes 7% of licence fee resources to aid independent production. It's quite interesting, the Irish government did this uh, during a period of recession, so there are both infrastructure and tax measures that we could use within uh, independence with full fiscal powers. Many thanks. Question six, Stuart Stevenson. The Scottish Government, what uh, role it considers uh, British embassies should have in promoting Scottish interests? Minister Humza Yousaf. As set out in the Concordat on International Relations that forms part of the MOU on devolution, the Scottish Government considers that United Kingdom embassies, high commissions and other missions overseas should serve the United Kingdom in all its constituents' parts, which of course includes uh, the promotion of Scotland's Scottish interests, be that trade and investment interests, diaspora engagement, or geopolitical interests. Thanks. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, can the Minister confirm that while any EU embassy is available to our citizens when they're in distress, it seems that promotion of Scottish interests is only uh, the responsibility of UK embassies. Is the Minister aware of any significant UK embassy activity aimed at promoting Scottish interests that took place on recent important Scottish days such as St Andrew's Day, Burns Night or otherwise? Minister. Thank the member uh, for the question. I have to be fair to British High Commissions. When I have travelled out in the last year and a half of the role, they, tends to, they tend to hold a Scotland-themed day. Uh, that's one day out of 365. And I looked with concern at the Business for Scotland article uh, when they had contacted 20 embassies across the world and not a single UK embassy had planned any function or wider form of activity to promote Scotland's National Day. Um, and they were contacting embassies in pa uh, Paris, Berlin, Brasilia and other key Scottish markets. It's only with independence and our own network of embassies that we will promote Scotland 365 days a year, yeah. promoting the interests of our people. 
Lewis MacDonald. I'm sure Mr Yusuf would confirm that British embassies have supported ministers from successive Scottish administrations in an absolutely uh, professional and effective manner in promoting Scotland's interests, not one day a year, uh, but every day and on every occasion that Scottish ministers have sought that support. Minister. Oh, I've, I said in my answer, very fairly, whenever we've travelled, we've been supported. My point is, it's just, it's just a logical fact. Uh, if you are representing constituent parts of the UK, most of your time as an embassy is probably uh, focused on the City of London. Uh, that is just the case. So 365 days a year, we probably wouldn't be able to expect UK High Commissions to represent Scotland's interests. But with independence, our own network of 70 to 90 embassies across the world, 365 days a year we have Scottish interests, not just in Burns Night, not just in St Andrews, but all year round. And I think that's something all of us can be very proud of. Question 7, Colin Beatty. To ask the Scottish Government how it's promoting National Libraries Day 2014. The Scottish Government recognises the importance of public libraries in Scotland. We work with Scottish Library and Information Council to support libraries and to promote National Libraries Day 2014 in Scotland. I, I would encourage all MSPs and communities to use this as an opportunity to visit their local libraries and attend events being held to mark National Libraries Day on the 8th of February. Thank you. Colin Beatty. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that libraries provide an essential foundation to our local communities and that events such as the Love Your Library programme held throughout Midlothian in the week from 3rd to 8th February are crucial at promoting library services to the general public? Yes, I would like to commend Midlothian Council for their five-day um, series of events promoting libraries. The services they provide are not just um, in, in relation to literacy and in relation to book lending. Indeed, they are and do lie at the heart of our communities and the services they provide. So it is an opportunity to celebrate our libraries and to demonstrate the importance that we hold them in our society. Many thanks. Question 8, Gordon MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government how many UNESCO World Heritage Sites there are in Scotland. Secretary Fiona Hislop. Uh, Scotland has five World Heritage Sites of outstanding universal value. Four of them are designated for their cultural heritage value. The Anstein Wall, Heart of Neolithic uh, Orkney, New Lanark and the Old and New Towns of Edinburgh. The fifth site, St Kilda, is one of the few World Heritage Sites to hold dual status for both its natural and cultural qualities. We hope that the fourth bridge will become the sixth Scottish uh, World Heritage Site in 2015. The bridge is the current uh, UK nomination for inscription and the dossier was submitted to UNESCO at the end of January. Macdonald. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. As a former resident of Queensferry, it's good to see that after 124 years, the fourth bridge is finally being recognised for its iconic design. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline the boost to tourism uh, Scotland can expect from the rail bridge being granted World Heritage status? Well, the fame and beauty of the bridge is already well known, uh, but uh, what we did last year as the preparations for the nomination was to invite the economist and World Heritage expert James Rebanks to assess the potential impact on tourism, and he concluded that World Heritage could significantly boost tourism and other local and national businesses. There aren't baseline figures in which to compare, but in terms of the impact, one of the reasons the nomination was put forward by a consortium of partners, including Visit Scotland and local business interests such as Queen's Fair ambition was to make sure the tourism potential was also recognised. Thank you. As quickly as possible, Gavin Brown, question nine. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, to ask the Scottish Government what its main international strategy priority will be in 2014-15. Minister Holmes, are you, sir? Scottish Government's international priorities uh, support a purpose of increasing sustainable economic growth. Gavin Brown. Thank you. The budget line for international strategy and reputation falls by 48.5% next year. Can the Minister explain that? Minister. Uh, look, um, uh, well, we are continuing, of course, to promote Scotland's interest. Uh, we are doing that in an efficient way. We are cutting costs. We are cutting costs, uh, be it on travel, be it uh, in terms of uh, any of the promotion that we do overseas. I thought the Conservatives, the, as the austerity budgets filter through from Westminster, would welcome the fact that we are being more efficient in government and still promoting Scotland's international global reputation on the world stage. Many thanks. Um, and we'll now move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 8914 in the name of John.